Yeah, I'm on. I'm on the PowerPoint mode, and um, no, you're, you're you. Sorry. Yeah. Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. We're now live. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dr. Simon okay. Long, and I am hosting the first host for today's program in honor of Dr. John Mew and our Stop Retractive Orthodontics International webinar. So John has put together a group of uh, speakers uh, throughout the world, and we've broken the format into a webinar form that is being broadcast live uh, at the moment in three separate time zones across the world. On today's date, the 27th of September, uh, 2020. The uh, groups will be talking in sequence. We will represent the Asia Pacific group. This will be followed in two hours time by the European group where John will be a speaker. And then that will follow uh, by the third group, which will be the Americas and hosted by uh, Dr. Bill Hank. Um, as the host for the Asia Pacific group, I will introduce today's speakers, their topics, and the panelists, which will host uh, responses in the question and answer and discussion period. There are four dentists representing Australia and one representing Asia. Our first key speaker today and panelist is Dr. Derek Mahoney. Dr. Derek Mahoney is a specialist orthodontist who's registered in New South Wales and Australia. A graduate of the University of Sydney, he holds a master's uh, of orthodontics in the University of London and is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons in Edinburgh, Glasgow, England and Canada. He's also a graduate of the dental sleep medicine uh, program at the University of Western Australia. And I believe he will be soon uh, to be awarded uh, his PhD at the University of Barcelona on orthodontics and sleep. He is a regent and fellow of countless orthodontic and dental associations throughout the world, a private practitioner, a clinical teacher, and founder of the Mini Residency Orthodontic Program, EODO, in Australia. He's an international speaker and researcher uh, for some three decades now. His primary focus is on educating dentists throughout the world and focusing on, in clinical practice, early interceptive orthodontics, facial development, and airway-related disorders. We will then be followed by our second speaker and panelist, Dr. Huyen Won Ari Yi. She is a general dentist registered in South Korea and California, USA. Principal dentist of a private practice in the city of Changwon with interest in oral maxillary facial surgery, early intervention orthodontics, and is currently the president of the Korean Orthotropic Society and the Korean translator of John Mew's The Cause and Cure Malocclusion. In amongst panelists, we have uh, Dr. Trevor Barrett. And Dr. Trevor Barrett is a general dentist registered in New South Wales, Australia, a graduate of the University of Sydney and a graduate of the Diploma of Clinical Orthodontics at the University of London. He's a member of multiple associations, including the International Association of Orthodontics, the Australasian Academy of Oral Facial Orthopedics, the Australian Society of Clusal Studies, the American Academy Craniofacial Pain, and for the past 35 years has practiced clinically and been an educator in the field of sleep dentistry, craniofacial pain, dental facial growth, development, orthopedics, and orthodontics. We also have in our panelist, Dr. Eric Davis. And Dr. Eric Davis is a general dentist registered in Queensland, Australia. He is a fellow of the Australian College of Nutritional and Environmental Medicine. He's a leader in the field of biological dentistry, trained in acupuncture, neurotherapy, and homotoxicology. 
He's a principal of a long-standing dental practice and clinical director of nutrition diagnostics. He's been practicing orthotropy since the early 90s, treating his sons, who now I believe is a dentist in his own practice and practicing orthotropics and in orthodontics. And finally, myself, I'll be a post and uh, panelist for the Asia Pacific um, group. My name is Dr. Simon Wong. I'm a general dentist registered in Victoria, Australia. I'm a graduate of the University of Melbourne. I'm a fellow in the International College of Continuing Dental Education, a fellow in the International Academy of Dental Facial Aesthetics, visiting professor of orthodontic department at the University of Valencia, and clinical researcher at the orthodontic department of the University of Alberta in the field of orthotropics. Principal uh, in an early intervention practice, uh, focusing on the new orthotropics, orthodontic practice, and the founder of a continuing educational program named Postural Orthodontics and Straight Teeth Naturally. So um, that concludes uh, the summary of our speakers today and panelists. Uh, the, format, the format will be uh, two discussions running 25 minutes each with Dr. Derek Mahoney uh, leading the talk on retractive orthodontics and its side effects. That will be followed by 20 minutes of open forum Q&A and discussion. Uh, that will be open to the general public. And uh, then we'll follow with a second talk by Dr. Ari Yi, who uh, will talk on forward growth and its benefits, again, followed by a 20 minute open forum discussion. So um, we are running a little bit ahead. So that's not necessarily a bad thing because that will give us time uh, for more questions. Uh, as we need to. So introducing Dr. Derek Mahoney with his first topic, which is retractive orthodontics and its side effects. Thank you, Derek. Thanks, Simon. Um, you can see the first slide. Um, I've put together a classification based on facial aesthetics. And for many years, um, what John Mew has been talking about is that a good face will be a forward growing face and will also have a good airway. And when I started my PhD study, we looked at children who were referred in for malocclusions or dental problems, but we did something different. Um, we had a null hypothesis that possibly the malocclusions were leading to what's called sleep sort of breathing problems. So if you look at these classifications, the top left uh, is what we want our patients to be. The upper jaw is in the right position and their lower jaw matches that. And when you look at the field of orthotropics, it's the only part of orthodontics where a lot of attention is paid on the position of the maxilla. And what I want to present today in the short time I have is how some of the outdated cephalometric analysis already create a debate and a, um, uh, an argument, if you like, uh, between what is best for the patient. Because if we use standard cephalometric norms, we're not going to achieve the sort of goals that we want to achieve, which is better looking faces, healthy temporomandibular joints, and, and good airway. So um, there's many classifications. Um, I use a combination of John Mew's uh, indicator ruler to determine where my upper jaw should be. And I also use a modified Sassouni analysis where I look at the anterior arc of the face, which is based on the cranial base of the child. So after age seven, that's a fairly stable landmark. We then look at the vertical to see if the patient is growing forward or backward. And to in my studies and my research, patients whose upper jaw and lower jaw are behind the arc, as well as have a long face, are those who are going to be the most prone to um, less attractive profiles, more chance of what we call obstructive sleep apnea. And um, my colleague and I, Kevin Boyd, who's a pediatric dentist um, in the US, uh, have come up with a classification which we'd like to introduce, which is called class four. And class four represents the faces that John Mew has improved over the many years he's been uh, in the dental profession. So class four, is that unlucky individual whose upper jaw has grown backward uh, and whose lower jaw has grown further behind that. 
And on top of that, the face is longer than it should be. So it's what York and Schieler termed a backward growth rotator. And if we look at the original work of um, Dr. Raymond Begg uh, in Australia, when he looked at Aboriginal skulls, and he realized that these Aboriginals had no crowding, they had beautiful arch forms and a nice class one occlusion, okay? Uh, and if you look at their jaw, their jaw is very square. But if you superimpose that over the work done by uh, Bjork and Schieler, when they looked at um, a modern European population, uh, and that was an average of uh, 1,500 Swedish shoulders, um, you can see that the modern face is growing backwards. So John Mew's uh, uh, postural premise makes absolute sense, that if you have the upper jaw in the right position and the tongue in the right position, and you learn to breathe through your nose, you will get more forward growth of your jaw, hence a more attractive face. Now, there's many ways to measure this, but John has come up with a very good formula uh, where he superimposed on cellar vertical uh, or on the tragus, and he uses that against the Frankfurt horizontal. So if the chin or napkin moves at over 45 degrees to Frankfurt, then that growth is what we know as vertical growth. And again, uh, courtesy of John's uh, slides, um, this is a good looking face, but we have to ask ourselves, why is it a good looking face? And I think John has been able to show that a good looking face does not need to be subjective. We can actually quantitatively measure what's going wrong and we can measure it early so we can do something um, about changing that uh, adverse vertical growth to forward growth. So if we look at uh, this lady, uh, she's obviously finished her growth and if we superimpose uh, her x-ray over her face, you can see uh, what's called an antigonial notch where my cursor is which is a classic sign that her jaw has grown backward rather than forward. And for many years, people have debated what's attractive, what's not. But if you add to the puzzle now, airway, what you see, there's many, many studies uh, that show that a backward growth rotator will have a compromised airway. Nowadays in my practice, I use exclusive uh, CBCT uh, or 3D scanning. Uh, and one of the leaders in this field is Dr. Uh, Juan Quintero is an orthodontist in Florida who also has been fighting to treat early so that children have the best opportunity to have facial balance. And I went to orthodontic school in London at a very prestigious Eastman. I learned how to straighten teeth and they taught that very well, but I was never taught how to analyze the face or look at the airway uh, to see what would be uh, a, a parameter. And we used an, an analysis where we had to move the teeth at all costs into an ideal occlusion, but we didn't pay attention to what that ideal occlusion may impact on the facial aesthetics and on the airway. Now I can measure the airway in children in 3D. If you look on the left, this is a classical class four patient. The upper jaw is set back, so is the lower jaw, and you can see the airway is in the red. At the end of treatment, after arch development and moving the jaws in a balanced position, you can see how much improved the airway is. Now, you can do it while the child's growing, or you can wait till facial growth is complete, and then what are you doing? You're doing a major surgery, what we call a MMA, a maxillary mandibular uh, advancement procedure. So if you look at the x-ray on the left, you can see where my cursor is, how compromised the airway is. When the upper jaw is moved forward and upward, and the lower jaw is moved forward, you get very good balance uh, off the face. But if you look at the airway, you can see the vast improvement. So this young lady is a mouth breather. She has had vertical growth of her face, and both her upper and lower jaw are retrusive. Um, and regardless of what she thinks of her facial aesthetics, she presents for treatment because she has obstructive sleep apnea. So for those who don't understand what that means, that means that during her sleep, she stops breathing, and it could be uh, partial obstruction or total obstruction. Uh, people who have undiagnosed uh, or untreated sleep apnea, if you look at the research, can die 10 years earlier than a similar individual that doesn't suffer from sleep apnea. So now the debate has gone 
away from just what is a good looking face to what is better for the patient's health. And obviously, if you look at the girl on the right after her uh, two jaw surgery, her face looks better, uh, her airway has improved. The, the question I propose to the audience is why would you want to wait until she's 21 and the damage has already occurred when there's something you can do to guide growth? And I love John's term orthotropics, which comes from the Greek orthos to correct, uh, tropics growth. So if we can correct facial growth while the child's growing, why would you not want to do that? And John has shown clearly in this young individual who has the same face as this girl, but is at an appropriate age for treatment, which is eight, um, developing her upper jaw, moving it forward to balance her face, and then allowing the lower jaw to catch up. And look at the amazing changes uh, in that period of time. Um, so let's just quickly review some basics uh, or for members of the audience who may not be familiar with John Mew's uh, teachings over the years. John in 71 came up with an indicator line, and I'm pleased to say that the maxillofacial surgeons that I work with who actually do these procedures use his line as a guide on where to position the upper jaw during surgery. And they love it because they now realize that their end results look so much better than they were when they were using traditional cephalometrics. So as I said, I'm trying to avoid the orthognathic surgery if we can. Um, so how can we do that? Well, you want to start measuring this on all your kids that present for a uh, dental exam. So I don't care if you're a general dentist, a hygienist, an oral health therapist, or an orthodontist, you have the opportunity to use this simple tool um, on all your patients. And basically, this line represents the distance between the tip of the nose and the incisor. Um, and it gives you an indication, and I'll say that word again, it's an indication on where that upper jaw should be. And if you see that that line is drastically increased, that's a warning that that child is probably going to experience the growth rotation that we don't want, which is excessive vertical growth. So as a guide, from age five, that line should be 28 millimeters, and it increases one millimeter every year until puberty. When it's then about 38 for an average boy and 36 for an average girl. So quick guide, just measure that distance, Ask the age of the patient, add 20 through to their age, and it gives you an indication. And this, again, is published research by Dr. Mew. Uh, it's in his textbook, which I thoroughly recommend every orthodontic student should own and read. Um, and um, uh, in the summary, you can have a look at the age here. You can look at what the ideal line is. And then you can look at if the uh, uh, measurement you take on the child is vastly increased compared to what should be ideal, you can look at what would have on the appearance of the face. Now, what I'd like to add is another column, thanks to the research we've looked at, and that is if I was to add chance of sleep disordered breathing, you'll see the greater that distance is um, from ideal, the higher the chance of sleep disordered breathing, which is uh, not just um, sleep apnea, but also includes things such as snoring and mouth breathing, um, et cetera. Um, so very simple uh, guide, and I think if you can do two things for your kids, get them in at the appropriate age, and I like doing that at age seven, seven to nine, not just me, the American Association of Orthodontics has been a leader in the field asking orthodontists to get their general dentist to refer kids in, not at the orthodontic age of 13 and 14, when facial growth is complete, but also, but more instead, uh, between ages of seven and nine. And last year, the AAO published a white paper on the importance of uh, orthodontists interacting early to help children to uh, reduce their incidence of obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, if anyone in the audience is interested in getting a copy of that paper, I'm more than happy to do that. Just send an email. It's info at Um, So I think uh, John's been talking about facial aesthetics, and I've been in this business um, 32 years. I've lectured around the world. I've listened to many speakers. I've attended uh, many lectures. And to this day, I've not seen as good looking faces uh, in before and after cases as I have with John Mew. So um, I know John gets a hard time from the uh, establishment, I think is the word. Um, and uh, I, feel, I feel sorry for patients uh, that uh, 
that uh, someone is uh, criticized as much as that for doing the best thing he can for, for his own patients. So um, please start using a mu indicator ruler in this little girl. She's nine. Her measurement is 48, which is 13 millimeters uh, more than it should be. So that tells you now's the time to get going with that. I think this is a good reference um, from Bushang et al. in 1993. And they talk about um, the growth falling back along the same plane as the indicator line. So that means that that nose drops less than the maxilla so that that indicator line represents about half of the total increase in vertical growth. And what we're trying to do is to change that. So let me show you um, Brian. Now, I'm a member of the British uh, Orthodontic Association. And back in the day, they would send all their members a series of cases and you would look at the cases, give your treatment plan, and in return, they would send you what the average treatment plan would be for your colleagues. So in theory, you were then practicing what is called um, uh, a, a standard of care. But really, what we're about in this group is trying to go over and beyond the standard of care. So Brian's 11. He has a classic class 2 malocclusion. Uh, he doesn't have crowding, but if you look at his naso label angle, you can see it doesn't look too bad. But if you look at his malocclusion, uh, the way I was taught orthodontics, uh, you would say that he has protrusive incisors. We used Steiner analysis for many years. Uh, in fact, I used it the first 10 years in practice. And it's a very flawed analysis because Cecil Steiner based his analysis on one individual, which is his own son. So he took one x-ray of his son and he said, what a good looking boy. I mean, talk about bias. Uh, and then he traced that x-ray and he said, the rest of the world should use these standard norms. And unfortunately, Steiner is still the cephalometric analysis of choice in 85% of orthodontic schools around the world. So it begs the question, are we measuring the wrong thing to try and get the results or try to justify older style orthodontic uh, retraction? So um, his SNA, which is a measurement of his maxilla, is 90. Steiner's norm for his son was 82. So therefore, based on Steiner's uh, prediction, his maxilla is too far forward. So 91% of 400 British orthodontists recommended that this boy should have extractions and a further 63% of them recommended he should also have retractive headgear. So this is where the term retractive orthodontics comes from. Now, if you look at Brian's face, and if I was to cover up um, from his top lip downward, you'd see what a good looking face. When you then remove that cover, you'll see the real problem, which is his lower jaw has grown downward and backward. But unfortunately, and, and again, if we do the superimposition of um, ideally where his indicator line should be and where his mandible should be to match that proper maxilla, okay, like I showed you in Beggs uh, and uh, uh, Bjork's superimposition, you'll see that his face would be much better off if his maxilla was in fact brought upward and more forward, right? Um, but instead, uh, Paul Bryan has had the traditional retractive orthodontics. Um, he's had upper bicuspid extractions uh, and headgear. And if you look at his facial profile, I think the evidence is there. It looks worse than before he started orthodontics. So are we really doing the best for our children using um, outdated cephalometric norms? And if you further look at um, his facial growth uh, from where he started, which is the yellow line to where he ended, you see his face has actually grown backward and not forward. Um, so I think the summary of my lecture is, it's essential that we assess the position of the upper incisors in relation to the cranium, what I call the anterior cranial base from cell on to nasium. Um, uh, but we should also understand that the position of the maxilla can be changed. And for those who've never looked at an orthotropic backslash biobot case, you can see that even a case like this looks worse before it looks better. So by using a stage one appliance, we develop the upper jaw, we make room for the tongue, and we position the incisors to where they should be. And that gives us some landmark of where to position the lower jaw. So in Brian's case, if we use the indicator line rather than the Steiner analysis, 
His indicator line was 38. And based on his age, that's four millimeters too high. And um, despite that 11 millimeter overjet, um, you can see at the end of the treatment, the indicator line had increased. And that means that his face, if you look at the balance, has actually worsened. So it's just a, a practical example. Another fantastic uh, study by uh, Weil and Gibb in 2000, when he looked at growth direction, he looked at 84 cases who trained, uh, sorry, who had uh, the old school treatment. Uh, I trained initially under the BEG technique, which was very much on um, uh, uh, classical extraction, lots of class two elastics on round wire. So you, you, you increased that um, axis. Uh, remember, ideal is 45. And uh, on 30 extraction cases, their average was 84. And, and even non-extraction cases, so I know this debate will be about whether you take teeth out or not, but you can also do damage to the face by using all these newfounded um, distalization appliances. So if I treated Brian non-extraction and I still pulled his um, upper jaw back, uh, uh, then I would still not be doing the ideal treatment for him. And in the 68, sorry, in the 30 cases that had straight wire, fixed braces, no teeth out, again, the uh, d uh, growth direction was higher than it should be. And then if you compare to a similar sample of biobot cases, which I described earlier, which is to push the maxilla upward and forward and then allow the mandible to posture in its correct relationship to that template, you can see we're more along that ideal 45 degree growth axis. Um, Drs. Frankie and Bacchetti have been world renowned in their research on facial growth and development, and in particular using the cervical uh, vertebral maturation index. And what did they show? Increased vertical facial relationships uh, appear to be a skeletal feature that's correlated with a higher degree of incisor crowding. So my uh, uh, message to you, I trained in a program where we looked at the lower jaw and we looked at the lower incisor crowding. And anyone who had five millimeters of crowding or more had to have teeth out. That was it, right? Um, what I'm saying now, and if you look at the research, that crowding is a symptom. And the symptom is because, as you can see from this excellent paper, um, it's the, the dentofacial features that are associated with crowding of lower incisors are the vertical growth tendencies. And this paper was published in the European Journal of Orthodontics. Um, uh, and this is an example. Uh, um, Dr. Helsting from Karolinska Institute in Stockholm uh, describes nicely here when someone is a mouth breather with large adenoids and they adopt this poor posture, uh, their mandible grows backwards, they get that steeper uh, growth angle, and of course the pressure then uh, of the soft tissue on the lower incisors causes crowding. I was lucky enough to study under Professor Sten Linda Aronson uh, at the Karolinska Institute, and we published that research in the Australian Orthodontic Journal um, in 1998. Um, and what uh, that showed, uh, he studied a series of uh, matched uh, uh, individuals, uh, one group had adenoids removed and were taught to breathe through their nose. Um, the other group were a control. And the children who reverted from mouth breathing to nasal breathing had better looking faces, i.e. forward growth, less crowding, broader arches. So there's so much in the literature. If you want to take it back to Harvold's uh, studies, um, Linda Aronson's studies, there's so much in the literature to show that mouth breathing is not good for facial development. Um, and mouth breathing is one of the major causes of the maxilla dropping back, right? So again, uh, courtesy of Dr. Mew, uh, if we look at this girl, uh, she's eight and she has protrusive teeth, okay? Uh, but even though her teeth are protrusive, her indicator line is 10 millimeters too high. And that would suggest that her incisors um, are actually 20 millimeters down and back from their correct relationship. So again, we need to make these faces look worse before they look better. We need to get that maxilla and the upper incisor to where it should be, and then the mandible can move forward. So that's showing you um, her measurement on indicator. This is now showing you where it really should be for her face. Um, and then we know where the mandible should be. So very uh, didactive, predictive analysis. And I love showing this to parents because obviously they can see their child looks better with that. 
Um, again, this young man uh, uh, from John Mew's teachings um, uh, had a good looking face up until his parents bought him, a, I think, a gerbil. And uh, he loved that little animal, but he had an allergy to it. So he developed this classic, uh, what was called adenoid faces, but it doesn't need to be only in large adenoids that causes the problem. Now, uh, John has been using for a long time uh, a line, which I hopefully can describe here. And that is the line. Well, that's my time. Uh, that five. Is where, yep. Is that five minutes or that's time? Five minutes. Fine. Okay. So John has been using a very good practical line other than the indicator line. And he uses this cheek angle, right? Now, if you look at this man's cheek and you look at where it should be, where to the parallel to the nose, that's another dead giveaway. So he's a mouth breather, his maxilla's back, his mandible's back, and he has a long face. So what I would like to call, and I would like to introduce to the profession, a class four malocclusion, okay? Bisculptural retrusive long. But the problem is, at his age, much harder uh, treatment uh, to achieve. Not impossible, um, but certainly not as easy as it would have been had the diagnosis been made uh, early. So check the cheek line because it should be parallel to the nose. Look for that um, abnormal muscle bulge just by asking the patient to swallow and then you can see parafunctional activity. So I always say to my parents, give me your child when they're young and their face is still growing. I will help them to breathe through their nose and I will teach them to have their tongue on their palate with their lips together so that we could convert that vertical growth to afford horizontal growth. And you can see here using John's method of superimposition, which is photos with the child looking at their own eyes in the mirror. Uh, this girl has had 10 millimeters um, a forward uh, a forward growth. And that is what gives a good looking face. Um, this is a brochure that was put together for parents by one of John's um, students who is a, an orthodontist in uh, Niagara Falls. And I love giving this brochure uh, to uh, patients and parents um, because it shows them what could happen when the face continues to grow vertically, when the airway is not improved at the correct age, um, and it shows one of these patients, uh, and I love that little graph down the bottom by uh, Dr. Robert Ricketts, another giant in the orthodontic field, and he, he, he's alerting parents to say that the face is pretty much finished, um, most of its uh, facial growth, very early. So if you don't get in while the face is growing, um, and you wait till the pubertal orthodontic age, the face is already the size it should be for an adult, and the chances of changing it are greatly reduced. So this little girl who's six, who's been a mouth breather, uh, uh, no treatment has been done, uh, and look at her malocclusion. It gets worse. Um, I think we're in the few professions in medicine and in dentistry that will just watch a problem and intercede at the last uh, hour. Um, again, showing you the girl that we showed earlier, who also appears in that brochure. Uh, that's what we want for our patients. So thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, if anyone would like a copy of that brochure uh, or the AAO white paper, I'm more than happy to follow up. It has very good references. Uh, the Bjork paper I've mentioned in 63 years there. Um, and um, uh, right, so I think we're doing some question and answers now yes thank you Derek so now we're on question time um, so I'm going through the comment section there's lots of comments but not so many questions that I've come across um, so we one question was the first the first of the questions itself is I have a question if I'm 12 years old and my doctor wants to remove four of my teeth, put a palatal expander, and then three years of braces, should I do it? And that was uh, I, I, from uh, Ionasis. Yeah, so it's very hard to make comment on an individual case without adequate records. But the fact that the young lady is 12, she still has potential uh, to modify um, her growth. But 
it's very hard to, from a question, give an individual diagnosis and or treatment plan. But if in doubt, I always say, seek a second opinion. But possibly go to the orthotropic website where there's many dentists and orthodontists around the world um, who have their details there. Maybe seek an opinion from someone who's uh, uh, trained in the field of orthotropics before you remove the teeth. You can always remove teeth at any age, but if you remove them incorrectly, it's very sad to um, then have to try and put them back. And I'm looking forward to my colleague Bill Hang's talk where he'll be talking about, uh, I love that term, ret uh, extraction, retraction, regret syndrome. And, you know, both Bill and I have been retreating a lot of patients and patients that I actually treated incorrectly in my early years, I would admit, um, are retreating patients by reopening their extraction spaces. Um, but it's better to seek a second opinion before the damage is done. Um, one of the things that we always have to consider is um, the process of uh, what treatment is planned is based on uh, the doctor's knowledge base and skill sets. And um, if there's not enough room for teeth to fit and the training is uh, about getting the teeth to be in a stable position, then uh, having teeth pulled uh, makes sense. And sometimes we have to juggle our responsibilities. Uh, people will come in and say, look, I, I want to improve X, Y, and Z, and I don't care about A, B, and C. And then we find through experience at the end of treatment, we've dealt with X, Y, and Z, and then they say, what about A, B, and C? And we say, well, we can't, we can't deal with that because we talked about it. He says, well, I don't care. I want that fixed now. And life is a juggle. And as a profession, we have to make a decision to be able to provide treatment that is very predictable. And although many of us hate the idea of pulling a good teeth out, uh, the outcomes for straightening teeth are very predictable. The issue that we have to raise is how will it affect your general health and how will it affect your facial growth and development? And these are the things that you need to discuss with your orthodontist. You say, look, I, I understand you want to take teeth out to help me straighten uh, the remaining teeth. How will that impact me on the other parts of the things that you worry about? And bring it up. Don't just dismiss your doctor offhand and say, oh, he doesn't know what he's doing because he wants to take teeth out. Ask them, okay, I understand you want to take teeth out to help get my teeth straight. How will it affect other parts of my general health? How will it affect my sleep breathing? How will it affect my growth and development? And if you are happy with his answer and you feel comfortable, then go with the treatment. If you're not, then find someone who can answer those questions for you. Now, be mindful, you may not get the answer that you want. There are not a lot of people who can give you every answer to every problem. And it's juggling. So that's just something to, to talk about. So another question, disturbed Elmo. I'm 16 years old and I've had braces for six months after removing four teeth. Am I too far gone age-wise to have other options? Um, I'll answer that one because yep, yep, yep. Um, uh, we don't really have enough information other than a very brief history. And if you've had teeth out, then you're down a certain path. And sometimes um, going down a path and turning back means that you are in for a very difficult way of managing a compounded problem. You're 16 years old. We don't know if you're actually a male or a female. So we don't know whether your growth and development is uh, winding up. We know that if your growth is complete, a 16-year-old female would have completed their growth, then we have less issues with uh, increase of vertical growth because your growth is finishing off. If you're a 16-year-old male, you might have a little bit of growth left. And if it's a very difficult space closing exercise, then you might have increased eruption of the molars and an increase in vertical. However, we don't know if you're having teeth out because you started with an open bite and you needed to have the bite closed 
using a, an extraction and retraction technique. We don't know if you made the decision to have uh, teeth out because you were given the option of having surgery and you decided you couldn't face the option of surgery. So uh, we do need more information um, than just a general question. So again, speak to your orthodontist. Don't dismiss the person that you've entrusted to, to look after you. Uh, ask their advice and voice your concerns and um, communicate. All right. They may be able to find you a solution that you need uh, addressed that they weren't aware of. Uh, we have a question from Leo7109. What is your take on mewing? Yeah, so um, mewing makes perfect sense. Uh, and to me, it's a form of what I call myofunctional therapy. So if you can put your tongue in the right position uh, with uh, the correct force, you're stimulating those sutures off the palate. And when I went to dental school and orthodontic school, I was taught that at a certain age, the sutures can't be remodeled. But if you speak to someone in the know, if you look at a skull of any individual, those sutures never actually fuse. They're still amenable to change. Obviously, the younger you are, the more effective that would be. And again, in our uh, research at uh, University of Barcelona, we showed the best results were those children who had their airway resolved first, who had orthopedic treatment second, and then retained their changes with myofunctional therapy, which is um, mewing. Mewing is um, lips together, breathe through your nose, tongue on the palate. And I've seen some amazing changes, even in non-grown individuals who are doing this technique. So maybe, you know, I always say to my patients, uh, when they ask me the question of how long would um, I like them to wear retainers, and I would say, wear your retainers for as long as you want your teeth to stay straight. And I'm saying that because I know from the research in classical orthodontics that no matter what you do in moving teeth, they have a tendency to move back. But when I look back at cases that I've treated um, using orthotropics and who are good mouth breathers and good tongue posture, even without retainers, they have very good stability. And Dr. Rolf Frankel, uh, uh, who influenced John Mew, uh, also showed amazing cases, 40 years out of treatment uh, with no uh, relapse. So I think um, if you are an orthodontist and you'd like your patients to have, I have a philosophy um, to my patients say, I want to be the last orthodontist you see, meaning, you know, uh, I don't want you to go back. Uh, you know, if I treated you when you were 12, you go back at 20 with crooked teeth and you can go back again at 30 for your third go of orthodontics. Right. So mewing to me is an essential part of retention. If you can do mewing after your orthodontics, it will certainly help keep those teeth in the right position. Yeah. And I think um, uh, this is uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is John's son, Mike, who came up with that term. And I believe, I believe it's actually in the Oxford Dictionary now. Uh, it's so popular. It's huge uh, as far as social media. But I believe uh, it's actually been accepted. Do, do you know, Simon, is mewing been accepted in the Oxford Dictionary as a word? I, I, I'm not sure about the Oxford, but uh, I think it's certainly in all the popular um, yes. Uh, dictionaries. Well, I hope so, because yesterday I won on Scrabble by using the word mewing. <laughs> it, uh, it does appear in the, um, uh, in the online dictionaries. And I think that mewing is, uh, it, it's a very interesting subject. And I think it covers uh, part of the answers to the previous two questions as well. Mm -hmm. um, is the 16 year olds, uh, is it too late for them to go a different way? Well, I don't believe it is. Um, even without surgery, as long as they cover the myofunctional uh, uh, therapies, including mewing. Um, the previous question, I, 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 I believe it's a very extreme case if it needs both expansion and extraction. I've, I very rarely find a case where expansion doesn't provide all of the space required for alignment of the teeth. Um, the only really extreme cases where their um, maxillary 
teeth are way too far forward and I see that extremely rarely. That's that's in Sydney anyway. So um, I and think I the agree, viewing is a... Even I'd be inter I'm very interested to listen to my Japanese colleague because if there's any... If the toughest malacruz in the world, as far as I'm concerned, are in Japan because they have macrodontia, which is big teeth, <laughs> uh, and this classical um, thing. So if you can pull off non-extraction in Japan in a good-looking face, I mean, I take my head off to you. That's really classical uh, orthodontics. Hmm. Yes, a lot of Asia, a lot of Oriental Asia, uh, South Korea, uh, Japan, China. Um, they have uh, the trifecta of really bad growth with really big teeth mm -hmm. and uh, very, very aggressively uh, overgrowing uh, mandibles with very small maxillas. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, as many uh, divergent cases as there are uh, forward growers. So um, we, we have to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much uh, a believer in orthotropics. I, I, my whole practice is focused on orthotropics. And, um, but I, I am a purist in that um, I, f I follow the John's original teachings to the to the letter at Phil's law. And orthotropics is correction of growth. And uh, I, I find that we are successful when we address posture in a growing child. Um, and that's it. You know, many of the questions that will be fielded will be for non-growing adults who want a change that often can only be achieved via surgery because the growth has been completed. And although you do get the occasional exceptional shift where the posture is changed in such a way that it is so consistently good for years and years and years, and we are starting with an existing structure that isn't uh, completely um, divergent, then you can get some improvements. Uh, but to the order that you see in uh, case examples that uh, you know sprawl across the internet, I, I tend to find that it is uh, unrealistic. Now, many of the colleagues who are um, encouraging um, uh, the mewing techniques uh, as a, an answer to a postural problem, we have to understand that mewing techniques tend to be functionally driven. All right? They tend to be techniques that focus on strength and power. Yeah? Tongue push-ups, clenching. Uh, it is an important component of developing good posture, but it is often the antithesis of good posture. Posture is about softness, quietness, and stillness. It's about deep sleep when you're so paralyzed you can't move. That's what posture is. Posture is the stance that you hold. It's your still position. And it doesn't matter how hard you try to force it, you can't keep still and quiet in a uh, soft, closed position if you don't understand that process. And that process requires jaws that match, an occlusion that interdigitates, enough dimension in your mouth for your tongue to fit comfortably on the palate without obstructing your airway in the back. You can get away with it if it's one you're growing. You can't get away with it if you close your mouth and nothing fits and the best you can do is jam it up so your airway is blocked. And it doesn't matter how hard you chew, it doesn't matter how hard you push that tongue against the palate, you can't achieve that ideal goal. And until the structure is correct, can only then can you focus on improving your posture. T totally agree. Well, well said, Simon. And I think, again, in order, order of sequence, if you're a parent there with a young ch child, watch how they breathe, particularly at night. And if their mouth's always open, there's your problem. 
and you know you need to seek advice on how to improve that child's breathing then consult with an orthodontist who's trained in dentofacial orthopedics to change the structure and then finally maintain that improved structure uh, so the soft tissue doesn't collapse and that's what we call myofunctional therapy backslash mewing backslash uh, oral myofunctional training etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, let's see, can one do mewing while having braces? I have an overbite. Yeah, well, mew mewing can be done with braces on, uh, but if the braces are set up in a retractive mechanics, you know, then it's actually uh, counterproductive to what the mewing tried to do. So the answer is braces on their own, sure, but braces that are then connected with uh, headgears or uh, heavy class two elastics. It's actually going against what we're trying to do with mewing. And very often in deep bites, the orthodontist will apply uh, an attachment to the back of the incisors or the back molars called bite turbos. And what they're done is to get the front teeth away from being able to bite together and to get the back teeth away from being able to bite together so that the teeth don't clash with the braces. And in those circumstances, I'm not sure if you can do mewing because you're effectively biting on two front teeth and two back teeth if they even set up the tur bite turbos. A uh, question from Ian. Uh, regarding age, how old can a person be and still have potential to change his or her bone and facial structure with good habits in a natural way? That's a difficult question. It's like how long is a piece of string? Um, I think if I can ask people to look at the research by Professor uh, Hans and Enlo, in the excellent textbook, Essentials of Facial Growth. It, it talks about sutural remodeling and how the ideal age to uh, undertake what's called intramembrous ossification, which means the sutures of the upper jaw, they don't have any inherent growth potential on their own, but functional stimulation on those sutures, uh, which is the sinus uh, growing down by breathing through your nose and the tongue hitting the palate Stimulant, that's what forms a normal jaw. Um, and John Mew has a great video where he shows what an ideal arch should look like. And he says it forms that way because the tongue rests in that position from day one. But if you remove the tongue from that position by thumb sucking, due to tongue tie, by mouth breathing, the buccinator or the cheek muscle takes over and constricts that upper arch form, okay? So the thing is, the earlier you get onto the tongue posture, the better. And as um, Simon has already said, once the damage of the upper jaw is done, you've really got to recorrect it by making it the right size before you start your tongue repositioning. It's like a chicken on egg scenario. I get many referrals from speech pathologists, um, but they're sent at the wrong time because this poor kid has been trying to do uh, exercises that they can't possibly do because they're tongue-tied, because their jaw's too narrow. And only after I intercede and change the jaw structure and release the tongue, then the exercises become of benefit. So again, please understand it's not just mewing that's going to fix the problem. It's breathing, being able to breathe through your nose, making sure your jaw is the right development of the palate, I should say, and then getting the mewing done. Now, the upper age of expansion, there isn't any. It depends on the technique. I, in in non-growing individuals, I've been doing a lot of um, expansion using MSE. MSE is a technique developed um, uh, uh, in UCLA uh, where we put tads in the palate and we can still widen the palate without surgery, uh, even in an adult. If you don't want to have tads in your palate and you're a, a young adult, Another option is to use appliances such as homeoblock. Homeoblock does gentle expansion. Uh, you know, so there are ways to still achieve it. What I'm saying is if your palate is narrow and John Mew has a good measurement, uh, and I mentioned the Mew indicator, John also has a measurement between the molars. And the intermolar distance ideally should be 37. Anything greater than that is a bonus. 
Anything less than that, you'll be hard picked to get your tongue in the right position. So measure your intermolar distance and then seek opinions if you need to widen it in people who believe in expanding the palate at any age. I would have to support Derek in that. I, I regularly am expanding patients' uh, palates at absolutely any age. Um, so far, I've uh, treated people up to, well, in their 70s. Um, but the question was about whether it can be done by natural means. If you look, on, uh, if you look up mewing on YouTube, you'll see quite a few young adults um, who show their photos uh, of uh, progress from beginning of mewing until some time later. And you can see there that they are, in fact, expanding their, their arches to some extent. They're changing the shape of their faces. These are people who are seriously committed and they're really doing the hard work there, but they're doing it at any age. And I see no reason why you can't achieve something with mewing at any age, as long as you can get your tongue into the roof of the mouth. If your palate is just so narrow that there's no chance of getting your tongue there, then you do need some help from uh, a, an orthopedic uh, dentist or uh, orthopedic orthodontist who can help you to expand the maxilla. So I, I wanted to add into that comment, which is also the answer to Seikai's question of being 14 year old male with a slight bad posture and growth, uh, phrenectomy and braces, no other health problems. Wondering, you know, can orthotropics treatment help give me significant results? So um, we have to distinguish between what's possible and what's probable. You know, can, can man run under, oh. can man run 100 meters under 10 seconds? And the answer is yes, it's possible. Is it probable that you and I will be able to do it? And at what age would we have to start training and how long would we have to work to get even close to that? So the issue that we have to be concerned about is when we are in the health profession, we have to provide some form of percentage of predictability where when we finish, we end up with a result that's better and not having done harm. We know that everyone who says, I want the palate expanded, doesn't actually care about the palate. All they want is their chin to come forward. And they just learned that the palate thing is the thing that we talk about because it's the only thing that we in dentistry and orthodontics can have really good control over. Right? We can expand a palate at any age. We can do it with removable appliances. We can do it with MSC TAD uh, appliances and so on and so forth. For the older patients and the younger patients, we can use acrylic and we can use removable appliances. Now, how do we determine what's going to be probable? Well, we look at research. What we want to know is what happens in real life? What happens in growth? So we look at uh, Bjork's uh, growth studies from the 1969, 77, 83, where he did implant studies and mapped out what happens in growth, in good growth and in bad growth. And then we look at research from Bushang and Wang to follow uh, longitudinal studies. And what we know is this, the most true mandibular rotation, which is where that chin comes forward, which is what every young man wants in his life, is between the age of six and nine years of age. The greatest true mandibular growth occurs between six and nine. It happens to be two times as much as what happens in puberty. And this period of life for true mandibular growth, where the bottom jaw grows strong, basically peters out at the end of puberty. So when you're 14, it depends. It depends on where you are in your growth curve. Just because you have a chronological age does not mean your biological age matches. I, I, I have nine-year-olds who seem to be hitting puberty in my practice. And I have 14-year-olds who you know, it looks like it's going to be years before they have to pick up a, a razor blade. So what we do know is this, it will be predictable between the age of six and 10 to, to enhance bad growth 
turn it around and make it forward, upward growth. We also know that before the end of puberty, we can use John Muir's orthotropics to be a time machine. We can recreate that time where there are no front teeth, there's a big open bite, the tongue is thrusting, and there we put them into an appliance that improves their posture and their growth can change. If they hold in good posture over the next five or six years, because it takes about seven years for your bone cells to change over completely. So you have a seven year timeline, ideally before seven, possible up to 14, and then after that, you're talking about half a mil here, one mil here, as opposed to the one centimeter or one and a half centimeter that you really want. So that's possible, but not probable. And that brings us now to our next segment. We are 3 p.m. And now I'm going to reintroduce you to Dr. Yi, who will the second talk of the day on forward growth and its benefits. Dr. Yi. Uh, Honorable Professor Zhang Miu, colleagues and everyone, good afternoon. I am Dr. Hyo Nguyen Yi from South Korea. Uh, today, uh, I'd like to share with you some of the results that my patients have achieved from the forward growth. Uh, forward growth can be when people keep their oral posture correct at rest. When the vertical growth is apparent, the appliances can be added to catch up with the shape the patient might have had if she or he had a good oral posture from a younger age. I used the Bob Lark orthotropics to achieve the forward growth to the following patients. I hope this presentation can provide some ideas to the clinicians who are looking for an alternative from the retroactive treatment and to the patients who are now under the similar situation. These days, uh, there are so many children who have malocclusion. Many of them have ENT problems. I see some of them have pains on their TMJ head and neck. Sometimes I see children who have tic disorder, such as shaking head and blinking eyes. In addition, the sleep disorder is one big related problem as I observed. Unfortunately, the malocclusion tend to be treated as a single independent phenomenon, despite uh, these collateral symptoms seen with it. Uh, they are being corrected with extraction retraction, and sometimes with surgery. I think this is wrong because the malocclusion happens when the people who, whose face grows down and backwards. As I'll show you later, the extraction and retraction increase the vertical vector of the face who already had a vertical growth. Thus, in my opinion, if we want a non-recurrent cure from these symptoms is related with the vertical growth, the forward growth and remodeling would be the only answer. This nine-year-old girl had a nine millimeter, I'm sorry, a nine millimeter overz and complete deep bite. Hmm. Due to the overjet on the interiors, the orthodontics probably assume that uh, the orthodontist probably assume that her upper teeth. Oh, uh, to uh, ortho, uh, assume that her upper teeth need to be retracted. This photo was taken four years later. It seems like the upper anteriors got retracted to meet the uh, two millimeters RZ. But what actually happened? It 
こう This is a stressing from her x-rays with the growth. The point A moved forward 6 mm, while the pagonium grew forward 8 mm. The growth direction of the mandible was 43 degrees. Thus, what really happened during these、uh, three years is that her both jaws have grown forward with restricted, restricted amount of vertical increase. This allowed enough room for her teeth, including the space for her congenitally missing lower lateral incisors and airway for her head to be held up straight.、Uh, the chronic rhinitis and her laser bleeds disappeared and it never came back, and her susceptibility to colds was lowered. This seven year old girl was referred from her dentist because of her crowding with an open bite. She had retreated jaws and a tendency of class three malocclusion with weak muscle tone. Her father, who was a physician, said that、uh, she was weak in general because she didn't enjoy eating. He was informed me that she had chronic rhinitis and was vulnerable to airway infection. She had a history of frequent hospitalization for pneumonia. Her father was also worrying about her asymmetrical head shape.、Uh, the second photo was taken when she was 12. Now she is healthy. Her mother says eating too much is her problem now. No more chronic rhinitis and no further high susceptibility to airway infection. Her head shape is more symmetrical now, in addition to the improvement of dental arrangement and facial appearance.、Uh, this is her tracing from the x rays. Both of her jaws grew forward in some amount. Her growth direction is under the Bolton group, in spite of her weak muscle tone. When growth has been made forward, There will be more room for the tongue, dentition, and airway, improving the facial appearance and head posture. I'm sure that the forward growth decreases the risks of collateral symptoms such as sinusitis, breathing restriction, sleep problems, headaches, muscle pains of the neck and shoulders, ADHD, TMD, and flatter and longer face with double chin, etc. Now, I'll show you the adult patients' cases who had experienced most of the stated problems. I prepared three of my adult cases who recovered from the symptoms that interfered with their daily lives. All these patients have histories of conventional ortho. As I discussed before, their previous symptoms, such as TMD, ENT problems, sleep disorders, pains, etc., tend to be treated as an independent single illness in different medical, dental, or oriental medicine departments. It's also true that、uh, these discomforts are being considered something aimed to be managed rather than be cured. But, but as we all know, this word of management also includes some risks to be ended up with the deterioration. All these patients had experienced the worst scenarios. They became worse with several management therapies from several clinics. To those patients, I apply the same method, the same method that I use to cure the malocclusion. In children. As a result, all their different symptoms responded, improving one by one in a short time. I'll start with a 24 year old woman's case. When she first came to my clinic, she was suffering from her mouth opening limitation. And pains, especially in her head, neck, shoulders, and back. She was only able to open her mouth about 20 millimeters. 
those oh, she had been eating with a baby spoon for more than seven years. She wasn't able to eat solid foods. She had been taking painkillers almost every day during set periods. She said uh, she had to decide to move back to South Korea from Canada, where she was studying in, to get treatment because her life was severely being hampered. This is her initial photo that shows her class to deep bite and both jaws in the retracted position. As I stated earlier, she has a history of ortho treatment. She had received three years of conventional ortho, including one tooth extraction around the age of uh, 15. Her TMD, which started with simple joint noise, quickly worsened into the opening limitation. To my surprise, to my surprise, after six weeks of Bioblock stage ones with the posture training, her opening limitation that tortured her for over seven years was resolved. Also, her headaches and jaw pains had disappeared due, during the stage one period and has failed to return. This is the photo taken recently. About two and a half years passed. I think both her jaws advanced, advanced substantially. These are the x-rays before and now. Let's look at the superimposed tracings on the SN line. This is the tracings from the previous x-rays. As you can see, both of her jaws moved upward and forward. I want to ask clinicians watching this slide, if you have ever, have ever seen this change, uh, from the conventional ortho, if you know or is aware of the same or similar changes from a different treatment, please let me know. Please, I really want to know. Now, she's wearing the BioBlock Stage 3 appliance while training herself to keep the orthotropic premise. The patient and I understand the condition could get worse again anytime if she fails to keep her maxillary position forward. What I found with the TMD cases is that uh, its vulnerability can increase as a TMJ is being placed further backwards. This is another adult case involving a 19 year old woman. Her chief complaint was her sleep disorder. Her amnia was so severe that she couldn't even keep the state of sleeping for more than five minutes at a time. She said whenever she fell asleep, she experienced a tongue blocking feeling and woke up immediately, immediately. In fact, she had to lie in bed for a period of 20 hours a day without any quality sleep at all. This young lady, who was deprived of sleep was like a person who had no energy for doing anything. She looked very different from her peers. She was too skinny and weak, and it seemed that she seldom ate or bathed. When she first visited, she was wearing the fixed braces from the conventional ortho. That was nearing its final stage. Her dentition was straight with no spaces. When trying to warn her before treatment about the possible spacings and an open bite in the middle of the treatment, she burst into tears saying, please just help me to breathe, okay? That's all I want. These photos were brought from the orthodontic clinic where she had been previously treated. 
I see the fact that she had obtained a straighter set of teeth at the sacrifice of her facial appearance and health. In my eyes, she seemed that she had lost the figure of youth from her face. The after photo shows her face being flatter and longer than in the before photo. I suppose you'd agree with me. These x-rays are uh, also the ones uh, she had brought with her from the previous, previous clinic. Let's overlay them on SN line. Now we can see more clearly the changes she had been through with conventional retroactive orthodontic treatment. As you can see, her face smashed in and brought downward. Now I want to show you the changes she made from the orthotropic treatment in about two years. I hope uh, these changes are enough for you to notice. In my eyes, her face seems to become fuller and more youthful. Her dentition has gained much room for the tongue. This photo lets us to assume that she got her energy back to even put on makeup. At this time, she told me that she got a job and was working. She was getting her life back to normal. These are the x-rays taken in my office before and during the orthotropic treatment. Let's make a superimposition on the SN line. Uh, this is before and this is now. As you can see, both jaws also moved upward and forward. I arranged her photos in chronological chronological order, which face seems the best to you? Whichever it is, it doesn't seem like the middle one. This is the last case I prepared for today. Uh, this 22 year old lady was also wearing braces when she first visited. Her complaints were about the quality of her life being damaged by the TMD. Her symptoms forced her to take a leave of absence from college. She left because she wasn't able to manage her studies due to the pains and diminished ability to memorize. She said that she would find herself reading the same line on the same page over and over without understanding what was written. For years, uh, she had been through several splints. Joe joined arthrosynthesis and two orthodontic treatments. According to the patient, the second orthodontic treatment she had received was introduced as orthotropic treatment. As we all know that orthotropics doesn't prefer using fixed devices. It seems that the name of orthotropics has been impersonated. Anyway, to her disappointment, all these previous procedures were not able to alleviate her symptoms. This first, uh, the first thing I did, I removed all the brackets and wires from her mouth and asked her to keep the orthotropic premise. In order to help her to be reminded of her posture, I used a modified Bablex st stage three appliance. I kept adjusting this appliance according to her progress. This is a change she made in about two weeks, not two months. Just in 17 days, the dental open bite and asymmetry decreased naturally in the way her mandible swung upwards under the help of the stage three appliance. Isn't it amazing? Uh, this could be said thanks to good posture. 
After stabilizing her pains from TMD, I delivered a cycle of Babla appliances. This is her appearance, facial appearance and dentition at present. She is still under the treatment and keeps training herself to get a better oral posture. She says her condition now is almost normal. This year, she went back to college and is living a normal life now. This is her superimposed x-ray tracings on the SN line. Uh, she also shows uh, similar directional changes as with the other adult patients I presented earlier. Hmm. Today's topic is start retractive treatment. So I selected and introduced patients with a history of orthodontic treatment, especially the adult cases. However, strictly speaking, it would be correct to say that all of the symptoms introduced here are caused by the vertical growth and vertical remodeling. The malocclusion is not an independent disease since uh, the malocclusion is just one of the many symptoms of vertical facial growth. I'm also paying attention to other symptoms that may appear with malocclusion. In order to relieve all problems, I treat the vertical growth. For children, it will be necessary to help the remaining growth to be achieved horizontally. And for adults, it will be necessary to help their faces to be remodeled forward and upward. Since the retractive treatment retracts the face that's already been retracted, there is a concern that patients may create new or may worsen symptoms related to the retracted face. Therefore, I would like to ask clinicians to please stop retractive treatments that increases uh, the vertical vector of the face that already have vertical growth. And my advice to patients is to keep in mind their oral posture. Thank you. Your uh, excellent cases and um, uh, revealing what's possible uh, with uh, postural appliances and uh, a forced change in a, uh, even in an adult posture. So now we have some time uh, open to the forum for questions. I'd probably I'd like to make a comment there, Simon. I think uh, what Dr. Yee's really reflected is that orthotropics is more than just about straightening teeth or even improving faces. So a lot of our patients have these multitude of symptoms, like the girls that she would have been talking about would have also had endocrine problems, you know, hormonal problems, gastrointestinal problems. And it's quite amazing when you look that these growth disturbances are part and parcel, if not even exacerbating the conditions. So I thought that was a very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, back that up too, uh, that uh, Dr. E has managed to show us that uh, the orthotropic approach to treatment uh, is, is working in adults as well as in kids. It probably takes longer, but it works. And uh, that's been my experience over the last 30 years as well. Uh, so we have a question from Kim. Is Invisalign retractive? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I think so. I believe so. Uh, question uh, from Papush. Uh, is grinding in a toddler a sign of a condition? Yes, I think so. 
it's a grinding in a toddler is definitely definitely a sign of a condition. Uh, I think uh, most of uh, the people who uh, uh, open their mouth, uh, especially they open open their teeth apart uh, at rest, uh, has a tendency to grind their their teeth. So it is a sign of bad oral posture. So you have to focus. You have to keep. Uh, yeah, you have you should of uh, uh, think about it related with uh, bad, uh, the better posture. <laughs> it's not a good sign. So please, uh, mom, please uh, help the children to keep uh, their mouth and their lips and their teeth together when they are at rest. Um, grinding in toddlers is also. Uh, very strongly indicative of a sleep breathing disorder. Now, that is not necessarily snoring or sleep apnea. There are other sleep breathing disorders, but grinding is a, a classic indicator of that. And so that needs to be attended to. Uh, the other thing on, on those same lines, if you have a child who snores ever, then that's a breathing disorder and needs to be attended to. And that will often involve an ear, nose and throat specialist along with somebody who can help you out with the orthotropic approach to treatment. Um, no, I don't use uh, the normal braces after uh, too close a spaces between the teeth. I, uh, I, I don't, uh, there are two ways to uh, close the spaces. One is retraction, which I hate. Uh, the other one is uh, the closing uh, with um, approximating wires uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, retaining the teeth uh, uh, in, forward pos in forward position. So like this, uh, I, I, I will close like this, not in that way, okay? Well, so one now we talk about grinding. Many people aren't aware that every tooth in your mouth has its own eruption mechanism. Every tooth will want to grow and contact. Therefore, if you keep your mouth closed gently and don't put your tongue in the tooth, you'll find that every tooth will need to be. Now, in my experience, what's occurs because you don't and nearly everyone who rucks it complains that they can't find a comfortable position to close their mouth. It doesn't close in any one position. Some of their teeth always meet more or less than others. This is a clear sign that the teeth are apart at this. If they're all in contact, the eruption mechanism will make sure that every tooth will sit in equal contact. That's all I need to say. Thank you, John. Oh, okay. Um, the bruxing is a very complex um, process. Uh, there's, there's no specific etiology that we're aware of at the moment, but uh, we have a number of theories. Um, there's a belief system that it is a reflex to uh, towards uh, sleep breathing disorder. It's reflex action uh, to protect uh, against um, um, the collapse of the airway. It is possibly related as a reflex to re in response to pain. So when you're in pain, you'll, your muscles tighten and clench. Um, we know that uh, many people who have chronic back pain, joint pain, skin irritations, gut irritations, have a high tendency to clench and grind. Um, the latest theory is that it is a trigeminal cardiac reflex related to sleep. So, um, 
we are still trying to figure it all out, but certainly um, trying to get your teeth to mesh together in a nicer way is uh, what John proposes, um, and it's as valid as any other theory. In response to the, do you need braces to close the spaces at the end of orthotropic treatment? Um, the answer to that is it depends. Can you live with spaces? Do you want your teeth like a picket fence? Because uh, in most things in life, we have to juggle a compromise. We either have to focus on the orthodontics or we have to focus on the orthopedics. <laughs> We have to focus on the jaw, and we have to focus on the teeth. It's very hard to do both at the same time. Um, you know, John's philosophy has always been get the jaws right, get the posture right. The teeth will look after themselves, but be prepared to wait seven or eight years. And the answer to the question is live with the spaces of your teeth if your face is improved, because if you put braces on to close the spaces back up again, you might lose your gains. Focus on more important things, which is your posture. And let nature take its course. The reality is, when your jaw looks better, you forget that it looks better, and then you front your dentist and say, "When are you going to straighten my teeth?" And that's just human nature. You get a little bit, you think it's good, and then tomorrow it's not enough. So Juliana's question, can you do orthotropics and orthodontics together? And the answer is no. The answer is no. I mean, you can. Uh, then you get a jack-of-all trade and a murky outcome. Uh, mostly because orthotropics is a childhood treatment designed for prepubescent children. So you can't do them simultaneously because a prepubescent child isn't ready for braces. However, at the end of your orthotropic treatment and your teeth are crooked, you can always straighten those teeth. But our recommendation is hold off until the end of growth. So wait until you're in your late teens. Give your posture a chance to improve the position of your teeth naturally. And if it's not enough, then tidy it when you finish growing, when you have less likelihood of increasing vertical growth because the growth is finished. And Sushi question is, how do you fix teeth flaring after orthodontics? For example, in the case of moving top teeth forward, mask and underbite. I'll answer that if no one else can or wants to, because it's always one of those, you know, how do I, how do I, how do I um, fix a problem that I don't know uh, the solution to? And the answer is, if your teeth are flared, it means your lips aren't being held together enough. And there's something pushing from behind. So if you want to fix a flared incisor, keep your mouth closed more. Keep your lips together and that will naturally retract the crowns. If you keep your tongue on the palate, that will talk the roots forward. All right. Now, you need to do this 18 hours a day. And you can't have bad habits when you don't have that good habit. So it's very difficult. Now, the reality to that question is if we kind of break apart the history of the hidden meaning behind it is why did the orthodontist use an orthodontic technique to try to ask a skeletal problem? Because the answer is skeletal solution for a skeletal problem and an orthodontic solution for a dental problem. The only reason why you want to flare teeth uh, an underbite 
is because the jaws don't balance. Now, there are two ways that I'm aware of that you can fix the jaw imbalance. You can do a postural technique, such as orthotropics, in a growing child. You can attempt to do that in a young adult. Or you can do surgery to fix the skeletal problem with a surgeon who understands where the jaws are meant to be. So an airway-centric surgeon. Inspections of baby teeth of facial development. How does extraction of baby teeth affect your development? I had cavities. Eric, do you want to answer that? Because uh, nutrition is a big part of your life, and cavities come from really bad nutrition. Well, your your mic's off, Eric. I said that's absolutely correct. But the other factor I see in young um, babies and growing children is sleep posture. Um, so often, children are slept on their belly or their sides and you'll get this typical asymmetrical face um, which is extended back into the the development of their teeth and, and dental arches so i've seen children that have had extensive tooth decay where they've lost teeth but they've actually been back sleepers and they still end up with a nice symmetrical face as permanent teeth come through so that's another big factor, I think, is sleep posture, and we need to recognise that in, in young children. But the nutrition is fundamental. Um, we've strayed too far away from our ancestral eating. Um, I think if people want a general advice in that area, going to the Western A. Price website would give some just general good common sense eating. Um, as far as what tends to happen when you lose baby teeth early is that the space closes because the teeth around them move. Uh, imagine uh, a bookshelf of encyclopedias. You pull a few out and the rest of them start to collapse around it. So if you lose a primary molar at the back, then the permanent uh, molar often can move into that space and it will uh, reduce the space that's available for the underlying uh, teeth to come. Now, I don't know if John can chime in, but if a child keeps their mouth together mm. and their molars in contact, theoretically, if you lose your your second primary molar, but you're holding good interdigitation with your six-year-old molars, then they shouldn't move at all, should they, John? It only moves with your mouth open. Sorry, I didn't. He didn't hear the question. I was, I was just thinking, uh, very often if you lose a second primary molar, the six-year-old molars drift into that space. Yes, I can't tell all of that, but certainly the six-year-old molars will drift forward. Um, but, uh, Yes, but I was thinking if you kept your mouth yes. if you kept your mouth closed to begin with, and if you just move the anterior teeth forward, the posterior teeth won't necessarily come forward as much. They usually do in the end. And I find that um, certainly in a young child, the eruption of the wisdom will almost always open. But if it is in an older patient, Basically, may not close completely, but at least there at the back and the side of the mouth. Thank you. Um, so, she uh, has a question Is jaw surgery excessive if my underbite is mild? Orthodontists say that I don't need it, but I can if I want a full change. I want jaw surgery, but I'm worried jaw surgery has more risk than benefits if my case is not very severe. Uh, Trevor, your mic is off. Sorry about that. Um, I would say that this is uh, related to another question that popped up on the screen a, a moment ago, uh, also about 
um, a class three uh, malocclusion uh, in adults. Uh, it depends on what the real situation is. If the mandible is truly too long, then it might be that jaw, jaw surgery is the best way to treat it. Uh, but if the class three is because the maxilla is retruded, then surgery is not necessarily a good way to go. In fact, that is the ideal situation for the orthotropic and orthopedic approach to move the maxilla forward so that you can achieve the, um, the skeletal type one relationship. Um, so it really depends on whether it's the maxilla retruded or the mandible protruded or both. Uh, my orthodontist wants me to use forceps rather than intrusions to fix my four millimeter overbite. Should I go with it? Um, it it's, a, it's a question that I think is very important that you speak with your treating doctor. Right? Uh, sit with him, uh, ask them why he wants to use it, what he plans to do, what are the side effects, and I feel comfortable uh, if if. Uh, he can explain it to you in a, in a way that um, meets your needs and goals. You know, specific techniques require the clinician who's using them uh, to be versed and able to not only provide the treatment, but to be able to explain it to you in a way that you feel comfortable with. Uh, Juliana. Can we hear a little bit about the story behind orthotropics? About, about what about orthotropics? I can't read the writing. Can we hear a little bit of the story behind orthotropics? Oh, behind it. Oh, yes. Um, uh, it was when I was trying to think why people took it. Um, I found that it really wasn't because of their inheritance, many children who have um, uh, put their parents to abuse the street. Um, so I was looking for another explanation because obviously there has to be a reason. And I noticed that many, many of my patients who had their families also had open mouth posture. And in particular, I could see that their tongue was often waving around and not on the palate. And I think I realized that the tongue has huge power over the teeth. I was taught that the tongue is just soft and fits in with the teeth. But I then realized that the tongue itself fits, makes a huge difference to the shape of the overall arch curl and the alignment of the individual teeth. Thank you, John. Uh, Chassis, would, uh, could wisdom teeth extractions have caused TMD? Um, you, you, you can, you know, the joint is connected. Uh, to the lower jaw and sometimes when you uh, put a lot of pressure uh, in an extraction you can stretch the ligament and the ligament can be damaged and that might be you know, one aspect of acute damage to a joint uh, you can uh, you know a lot of temporal mandibular disorder is related to the disc being overstretched and it can be from any number of things such as uh, in your mouth open in the growth period, um, having uh, trauma to the joint and uh, bruxing. So these are many you know, various components to TMD. And TMD is a very wide ranging disorder. So, um, you know, joint damage, physical joint damage is also a, a temporal mandibular disorder. Um, so it just depends on what type of disorder you are talking about. Uh, Aeon has a question. In a class two malocclusion, will protracting the maxilla 
using reverse pull headgear and the TAD expander, MSE, allow the mandible to rotate forward. Who would like to answer that? Uh, mandibular rotation uh, has two components to it. There's a physical rotation of closure, and then there's true mandibular rotation. So um, true mandibular rotation is a growth phenomenon. So I would say that can't improve the uh, forward rotation in growth. But you can have what we call a closing rotation. If you can shift the position of the maxilla, then the mandible, when you close, will uh, close more fully. So uh, that's possible if you coordinate process or maybe intrude some of the molars along the way. So you can uh, create changes in the position of the maxilla that allows the mandible to close more fully and then bring the uh, But um, uh, I, I don't know if that's the the answer that you're looking for. There's a question here from Artem. Uh, Artem has a question. Is it possible to have a well-developed mandible but poorly developed maxilla? Yes, absolutely. All the time. Generally, that's called a class 3 malocclusion where the tongue rests below the occlusal plane and drives growth in the lower jaw uh, at the expense sometimes of the upper jaw. Um, if there is an attempt to keep the lips together while that's happening, then you'll have a, quite a square jawline, uh, but a very weak maxilla. Well, there's a question about whether people in the orthodontic profession will ever fully accept ortho orthotropics. Do you think the, in the dental industry will fully accept orthotropics or is there just too much uh, money involved for the current system to change? I think that in the end, orthodontists will be forced because the public will um, want to have a better long-term result. The current orthodontic treatment, after you've had your teeth straightened, they have to be held straight for the rest of your life. And patients don't want that. And if they stop the retention, the teeth go crooked again. But if you train the oral posture, the teeth will stay straight for the rest of the patient's life. That is what the patients are going to demand. And I'm sure that's why orthodontics ultimately will change. I, um, I, I doubt that the industry will ever fully uh, accept orthotropics. Uh, but I think that it's a, a, a strong growing trend and uh, I think that uh, the majority of the profession will accept orthotropics as part of uh, their overall treatment. The alternative provided by the per person asking a question I think is a bit harsh. I don't think it's all about money. Uh, there are many orthodontists who uh, truly believe that uh, the, the Steiner's position for A-point is the appropriate place. If that's what they truly believe, they're not going to change their, their minds. Uh, and it has, that has nothing to do with money. Certainly in some cases, money is possibly part of the problem. We have another question here from uh, Sushir. Are partially erupted mole, mandibular molars, are partially erupt, are partially erupt mandibular molars caused by small jaw or tongue between teeth or both? So uh, I'm assuming the technical term we're looking at is ankylosis. So when a, a primary molar uh, fails to erupt into the occlusal plane, um, the orthodontic profession, the dental profession, doesn't really have an answer to that. 
but John's theory is that uh, when a strong tongue uh, wedges tightly down against uh, a primary molar, it can uh, prevent it from erupting. Adam, uh, question, how can I straighten my teeth without damaging my face? I have an asymmetric jaw. Probably not quite enough information to comment, I guess. Um. To get up. To um, asymmetry of the face is related to uh, asymmetric uh, posture. Right? Your uh, resting posture is lopsided. So if you want to improve that and you have someone who can help you orthodontically do so, then you need uh, to be able to find a way of uh, correcting your oral posture. You need to be able to learn whilst the treatment of orthodontics is going on in your teeth to keep your lips together, your teeth together evenly and your tongue resting evenly on the palate then you can use the power of good posture to counteract any of the negative side effects of the orthodontics that happens when their teeth are being strained. We've got a question here about um, convincing others such as parents about the genetic cause of cricket teeth and uh, the importance of posture, I would have thought. Uh, yeah. How can I convince my parents it's not just genetics that causes crooked teeth. You, you could actually look at some of the work that's been done on uh, Western A web, uh, website, Western A Price website, where you look at the first generation children of parents that are failing to eat their ancestral diet. They may end up with a lot of dental decay the next generation start developing a lot of malocclusion because the mid third of the face is failing to develop correctly. But it's actually interesting as well that uh, our posture has also altered compared to our ancestors. So a lot of people were, were taught to sit correctly at the table. They were taught to eat correctly. Is that really isn't occurring now with our young children at all. So, and also, I guess Dr. Mu has done a beautiful study of identical twins showing that you can influence genetics. So we're not prisoners to our genes. Um, they need permission to express themselves. Okay. Uh, Alpha has a question. Can can you tell something about posterior open bite? I can't close my mouth while sleeping. Peaches. A posterior open bite is when you rest your tongue uh, between your teeth all the time. Uh, very often it's because you have a really big tongue and it's got nowhere to go but out the sides. Um, very often the rest of your mouth is open. Um, it can be with your lips open or closed. If your lips are closed, then you will have a deep anterior bite which is a hidden yeah. <clears throat> that the tongue should not touch the teeth at all at breath or when swallowed. The only time the tongue should touch the teeth is when you're speaking or eating. Many people touch their teeth when they are at breath and particularly when they swallow. 
That is when most damage is done, particularly the open bite that occurs because the tongue pushes between the teeth. Just make absolutely sure that you push your tongue up on your palate and suck it without touching the teeth at all. And then the spaces will close. Uh, Tega asked, how do you fix open jaw but with lip seal? Any comments here on the importance of lip seal here, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, lip seal is uh, fundamental to having a closed mouth resting posture. So um, there's lips at the front of your mouth, there's teeth and their tongue in the, in the middle and the back. So for the rest of the posture, your lips have to be in light contact, your teeth have to be in light contact, and your tongue has to be simultaneously fully on the palate and the floor of the mouth. Okay. Um, we're now just coming to the end, so we'll, we'll stop take, taking questions here. And we'll just invite um, the speaker, each of the panelists in turn, just to, to provide a few final comments. Um, maybe we should say ladies first. <laughs> um, uh, with today's uh, presentation, I wish to show to my colleagues and to in the audience uh, who is suffering from uh, the malocclusion and have, is finding uh, the way to treat uh, uh, the way to treat themselves, uh, especially the, the people who is out of the age, the ideal age to, to be treated with orthotropics. Uh, so I would like to send them the message that uh, in my experience, I think uh, there are ways to be better, even though uh, there are uh, out of uh, the age, like uh, even even that they are grown already. Yeah. Any other parting comments? Um. Yes, I, I would like to thank Dr. Yi and my friend Derek Mahoney for their excellent presentations. And also all of those that are, are viewing for some of those really good questions. Um, the whole purpose of this is to help to change the attitudes around the world, uh, uh, and particularly amongst the orthodontic community, about extraction and retraction. And really, it's the, the real push to improve the situation is going to be coming from the patients. Uh, if if our patients are asking for um, better airways and looking at the whole body's health rather than just making teeth straight, then uh, the orthodontists will be forced to take a different viewpoint and look more carefully at what's going on throughout the body. Um, I've been doing this for a long time and I learned very early that uh, by doing things properly, I was helping people to breathe. Uh, I was helping people's posture to improve. Uh, but a lot of the orthodontists take the word orthodontics, that is straight teeth, very literally. And that's all they look at. They only look at the appearance of the teeth. We need them to look further, looking at the TMJs, looking at the airways, looking at the overall body's health. And a forum like this is a great place to start but we need more pressure from our patients. Eric, what about any comments from you? Um, I, I think orthotropic principles are absolutely paramount in for our children, you know, in the future of them, because you can't divorce good nutrition, good posture and growth guidance um, because that gives a person health as they become an adolescent and as they become an adult. The problems start early, and so often we get involved in helping people 
once they're already an adult and they've got all these health problems, but the true problem occurs early, even in infancy, in breastfeeding has to be attended to, sleep posture, and they need to be have their growth guided through this process. So I think orthotropics is a beautiful biological system and a biological way of, of helping so many people, especially our children. And Simon, some final words from you to wrap up. Um, the, I think there, there needs to be uh, an understanding for both uh, the general public and uh, our profession that uh, it's important not to muddle uh, the management of jaws with teeth. They share the same space, but they're different uh, components within the body. We don't we want to get out of the habit of compromise. We want to get out of the habit of uh, sacrificing teeth to hide a deficiency of the jaw. We would prefer to improve the jaw so that we don't have to sacrifice the teeth. And if we can uh, do what, if we're prepared to do more in our profession and as uh, the lay public, be prepared to, to do more to accept uh, a more ch greater challenges. When you want something to be improved, it's never an easy task. And sometimes the quick and easiest of the solution is the biggest compromise. Now I thank all of you for contributing. One point that many people don't like to discuss is facial appearance and in particular facial beauty. Um, it's not considered appropriate to talk about beauty. But I might add that every teenager worries more about their facial appearance than almost anything else. But I do think that orthotropic can help to provide that. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for your um, contributions and your expertise. And thank every, everyone else for their um, uh, uh, questions. Uh, it's been a great session. Uh, we look forward, hopefully, to repeating this sometime in the future. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.